So my name is Terry Ann Fox. I am American. <laughs> um, I am a fermentation enthusiast, and I consider myself to be a food activist. Um, I live in Glen Cree. I moved to Glen Cree in 2017 from San Francisco, California. We bought a small holding farm. It's about six acres. We have a couple of dairy goats, a couple of polytunnels, about 30-odd hens. Depends when you count them. You know, there could be about 15. I'm not sure um, at this stage. Uh, we teach fermentation workshops um, and sourdough bread workshops. We're also in the process of building a micro bakehouse, uh, much like the one that Joe Fitzmorris has. <laughs> this oven is of, is of a um, similar description. It will also be, act as our uh, classroom space for education. Um, so usually I have a cabbage with me whenever I'm talking to people, so I feel a little bit out of place if you have no cabbage. I don't know what to do with my hands. I don't know what to talk about. Does anyone have a cabbage? Anyone have a cabbage? Yeah. <laughs> I also wasn't expecting you to be a stand-up comic. I didn't <laughs> like you. <laughs> He's been like the most reserved person in the room since he arrived. And then that, I like, don't know how to follow it. <laughs> Hold the old cards close to the chest, weren't you, buddy? So what we're going to do is um, we're going to have an imaginary sauerkraut demonstration. Okay, so here's my table. I have a head of white cabbage, a big bowl set here, and a tall mason jar or a, uh, a flip top style uh, Kilner jar here. Also a little bit of salt. Okay. So what we're going to do to make sauerkraut this evening is we're going to take our cabbage onto the cutting board with our knife. And we're going to chop, shred, or grate the cabbage, whichever way you like. Chopper's choice, okay? You can uh, cut the cabbage whatever way you want to. Pop it into the bowl, and we're going to add a little bit of salt. Sorry, Tom, are you going to bring an imaginary calf on stage? <laughs> <laughs> There's one at home, but I okay. Yeah, the purpose of this, of this illustration is to show you just how easy it is to make sauerkraut at home. You know, a lot of people they are, are, find it daunting to start fermenting at home. You know, they're not sure where to start, so I'm, I'm here to show you just how easy it is. So, a bit of salt. To begin to massage the cabbage, okay? We're going to start breaking down cell walls, allow the salt to penetrate the cabbage, extracting the water, creating its own brine. Okay, so this takes a little bit of time. Massage is, you know, it's a very gentle word. Really what you want to do is beat the hell out of it <laughs> with a rolling pin if you have one. Or if you're at home and you have other jobs to do, what I like to do is really get the salt in there, and then leave it be for a minute. Everybody wants to know how much salt do you use? What recipe are you following? It's completely up to you. There's never any consensus on how much salt to use. Everyone's tastes are different. So I like to taste as I go. Not salty enough. I know I like a bit of salt. What does the salt do within the ferment? It creates a saline environment where some of the microbes that we don't want in, in our kraut won't thrive, okay? So that's one thing that it does. It also um, helps to keep the vegetable crispy over time. Um, if you're using a lot of salt, it's going, something to keep in mind is that fermentation is going to happen more slowly. If you're using less, if you're using less salt, the fermentation will happen more rapidly. So often in winter time, when temperatures are cooler and fermentation is going to happen more slowly, I would probably use less salt you know, to try to get fermentation going more quickly and opposite in the, in the summertime. All right, so here we go. You can see some brine is coming out, okay? The whole idea with sauerkraut is that we want to create an anaerobic environment for the sauerkraut to ferment in. Anaerobic being that there's no oxygen. You can, re you can remind yourself of a little mantra. If it's under brine, everything will be fine, okay? Because if any of the pieces of the sauerkraut should float to the top, they're then exposed to oxygen, and this is where mold can accumulate. But don't worry. If your sauerkraut gets a little bit of mold on it, it's no cause for concern. Simply scrape it off and discard it. You know, you don't have to chuck out the, the whole batch of sauerkraut simply because there's a little bit of mold. All right, so if you're home, as I said, you can go away and do some chores and allow the salt to do its work and come back. Once you have enough brine to, to completely submerge the cabbage in, in the jar, um, we can begin to pack it, okay? So I see now that we have quite a bit of brine. Quite a bit of liquid is coming out here. So you get your jar. Everybody has a jar. No special equipment is required. Set your jar and begin to pack. You want to pack it as tightly as possible, eliminating any space for air and to really make sure that it's under brine. So you're really going to jam it in. Get your rolling tin out again and really push it down. One fist at a time. 
one fifth of ten. And you can of course add any other ingredients ingredients at this stage. Um, you know, you can add other vegetables if you have them. You can add herbs and spices. Whatever you would eat in a raw salad tends to do <coughs> really well in, in a vegetable ferment. Okay, so let's see here. Packing it all the way. You really want to force it down to make sure that it's under that brine. Now what you want to do is get a weight, something that you already have, um, in order to keep all of the cabbage under the brine for the fermentation process, okay? So what I like to use is a smaller jar. If you have um, like a, a smaller glass yogurt jar or a jam jar or even a rock will do the job, <laughs> you know, whatever you can find, a golf ball, well, preferably something that's food safe and, and probably not something that's plastic because, you know, the environment will acidify and it um, can leach toxins from something like plastic. So I'll use this smaller jar to put it inside my flip top jar. Hold the jar lid closed using the force of the lid to push that jar down and act as a weight, okay? There you go, there's your sauerkraut. It's not quite sour yet, we're gonna leave it now at ambient temperature to ferment. You're gonna read a lot of recipes and people talking about time and X, Y, Z that you have to leave your sauerkraut for a month. You know, that's, that's the rule. There are absolutely no rules when it comes to fermenting vegetables. Um, you know, it really depends greatly on your taste buds and, and what you're after as a flavor to sauerkraut. If you're new to eating sauerkraut, maybe you don't, maybe you don't enjoy a four-week-old sauerkraut. You know, that's going to be an incredibly sour sauerkraut. Maybe you prefer something uh, a lightly sour slaw, you know, if you will. <laughs> so we're going to close the jar and leave it in the kitchen somewhere visible. I like to leave mine right on the <coughs> kitchen counter so I don't forget to maintenance it. Because we've closed the lid on this jar, and this is just one method, you can of course use a cloth, but I find that the more exposure to air, um, even the brine, the more likely um, you are to get you know, mold um, on top of the sauerkraut. So what we're gonna do is close the jar, leave it at room temperature, and we're going to maintenance it every morning when we're doing our morning routine, so when we are getting ready for work and doing the breakfast, and every evening when we're doing the dinner and you know, sitting down with kids for homework or whatever it is you do in the evening. Um, so you'll notice that the activity begins kind of almost immediately, within kind of four to eight hours, you'll notice um, that there's CO2 building up inside that jar. So you're going to want to burp it to allow excess CO2 to escape. So in the morning, remember to bring it to the sink, okay? Bring it to the sink. Get a tea towel and cover it with a tea towel because during that, that burping process, you're gonna, there's going to be spillage. There's going to be literally, you know, Think of a baby being burped. <laughs> okay, a little bit of sprayage, you know. So you want to take the tea towel over the top, open, and close the jar in the morning and in the evening. At around kind of day four or five, depending on the conditions of your kitchen, um, something to keep in mind is that the warmer the temperature is in your kitchen, the faster fermentation is going to kick off. And, you know, the opposite if it's cooler. So in the morning, in the evening, around day four or five, things are going to slow down, and that's when I recommend people start tasting kraut. A lot of people um, in Ireland, and you know, tons of kind of uh, the Western world, we uh, have become unfamiliar with the tastes of fermented vegetables. So if you're new to fermented foods, as I said, souring mm -hmm. for a less period, of, a shorter period of time, might make them more palatable to you. So I recommend starting to taste after day four or five and keep tasting until you're happy with the flavor and then you can put it into smaller jars and refrigerate it to slow fermentation down. Now if you don't have a refrigerator, I mean most of us do um, nowadays, but if you, if you prefer to keep it somewhere cool, if you have a basement or you have a garage, that's a perfectly fine place to keep your, your sauerkraut. And fermentation will continue, it will just continue at a much slower rate. How many of you guys have made sauerkraut? Has anyone here made sauerkraut? Wow, I just did a demonstration. Half of you have done sauerkraut. <laughs> Has anyone fermented any other vegetables? Has anyone fermented any milk-based products? Has anyone made cheese? Has anyone made bread? Yay! Has anyone made sourdough bread? Wow! Has anyone made miso? Has anyone made koji? Tempe! Natto! Okay! I'm excited. We're going to read the vegetables. 
So a lot of people, there's a couple of schools of people that want to know, like, so when do you eat the sauerkraut? Some people are eating it because they like the compelling flavor. That's me. Uh, other people are eating it because they're just trying to get the probiotics into them. So a lot of people wouldn't want to know, like, when is the best time to eat the kraut in order to get, you know, more probiotics? And there's not a straightforward answer on that, you know. Um, of course, the older the ferment is, the population of microorganisms present in that ferment is larger. But the numbers don't tell the whole story. With, lacto, with, with lactic acid bacteria, each species of those bacteria succeed the next, okay? So if you're looking to cultivate biodiversity within your gut, possibly eating that eating a vegetable ferment at different stages of fermentation would you know give you a different bacteria at different times okay I want to kind of lay out the facts <laughs> would, would that be all right with you Dr. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, yeah so some of these the reasons why we might be interested in fermentation see this is the interesting stuff you know this part or I, I think this is you know how to apply this basic thing to your everyday life okay um, and, and that you can do it at home. You don't have to rely on a company or anybody to make this food for you. It's, it's a super simple. It doesn't require any special equipment. All you got to do is get your hands on a cabbage. So some of the reasons we might be interested in eating fermented food. A lot of people, there's, I mean, fermented food is like off the charts right now in the media with um, associated health benefits. Okay. <laughs> and people make a lot of outrageous claims to fermented foods that it can cure autism or cancer or AIDS or whatever. And I am here to tell you, well, or I, you know, I want to kind of separate myself from that sort of snake oil salesman stuff and talk about, you know, really the reasons, um, the health benefits associated with fermented foods. Um, for one, especially when it comes to cabbage, we know that there are B vitamins present in fermented cabbage that are not there in the beginning. So it actually becomes more nutritious. Um, we talk a lot about pre-digestion when we talk about fermentation, which it feels like you guys already know all this. Does everyone know all this stuff about fermentation? I should no, just go no, to the backstory. No. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, so pre-digestion. We know that, um, the, that, that um, fermented vegetables have been broken down and are more readily available for our bodies to absorb the nutrients. There's also something really interesting um, within fermented cabbage called isothiocyanates, which are regarded as anti-carcinogenic. That, of course, does not mean that, you know, sauerkraut is going to cure your cancer if you have it, but it certainly feels like a good reason to consume it regularly. Um, so fermentation was originally adapted by humans um, as a method of preservation. Uh, fermentation is very much a naturally occurring, very much like fire, okay? It's a, it's a naturally occurring process, much like fire. We humans did not invent fermentation. You know, we didn't even discover it. Okay, animals ferment their food. What is the bird doing when she has the seed in her craw? She's souring it. What is the squirrel doing when he's burying his nut? He's not hiding it. He's fermenting it to make it more digestible. It's the iron law of economy. Take as much as you can while expending as little energy as possible. <laughs> now, we humans know the most about that, given our current... Um, environmental situation <laughs> okay uh, so I like to use the best I like to use the best ingredients if I'm selling things to people however if you're if you're looking to clean out your refrigerator and you have some vegetables that are turning the best way to reinvigor and bring life back to those vegetables that are on their way out is is to ferment them in pickle brine or the dry one is it only cabbage that creates the brine no, you can do that. You can apply that to just about any vegetable, but you'll want to slice it thin um, in order to extract the brine. <laughs> it's totally up to you. Any salt will work, but I, I mean, I kind of recommend against iodized salt because that could you know, possibly interfere with the fermentation process. But, you know, you don't need to go out and get anything special. But if you're happy enough eating that ingredient, that's what I would use with. So what kind of salt do you use? Um, I usually use Irish uh, sea salt or Atlantic sea salt or kind of whatever I can get as local as possible. Yes? Is it legitimate to add a little bit of water if you haven't produced that much brine? So if you haven't produced that much brine in the sauerkraut method or the dry brining method, I would recommend adding another vegetable. What you get with the sauerkraut method is a more intense flavor. 
Okay, you get, uh, I think, a nicer flavor. Now, if you want to do a whole, pickle brine, whole, whole vegetable brining, like a pickle brine, you would basically just add salt water to the vegetable. Okay. Can you reuse brine that you You absolutely can. You can apply it to all kinds of new ingredients in order to ferment different things. One of my favorite things to do is to use um, leftover uh, kimchi brine. And, and often in kimchi recipes, traditionally, they do add a little bit of water. So that's just ever so slightly different. Um, or sauerkraut brine to inoculate my nut milk cheeses, you know, to ferment my nuts in those brines before pureeing them and to sufficiently acidify that environment. No, it's not just you. It happens to everybody. And it's okay. And once the environment is sufficiently acidified, you know, that whole underbrine, everything will be fine. That doesn't apply once it's sufficiently acidified. You know, I often am putting krauts and different fermented vegetables into my refrigerator with very low levels of brine and they still can last, you know. It doesn't, if you have a cool place to keep it, because remember that all of this, you know, all, this was all developed um, before we had access to refrigeration, you know, so, so keeping it in a cooler place will help to keep, you know, to preserve it longer, but you can definitely leave a jar of sauerkraut in your kitchen, on your kitchen counter in ambient temperature for, for a year. Now it's going to break, the pectin is eventually going to break down and it's going to become mushy, but it certainly wouldn't harm you, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make you sick or anything. <laughs> Terry, is there um, is there a maximum amount of vegetables that you can put together? You no. Know, no. There's no rules here, and I recommend that everyone get wild with experimentation. <laughs> <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about like what, how I got to where I am today. And my message is like less about fermentation and more about food and moving away from this industrialized food system. Okay, so. I'm originally from Iowa. Most of you probably don't know where that is. I mean, most Americans don't even know where that is. <laughs> but uh, so Iowa is in the middle of the country. It's right smack dab in the middle of the grain belt. Uh, we produce more corn and soybeans than any other state in the United States. I'm sure that most of you know that America is the leader in production of corn and soybeans. Okay, 99.7% of all corn grown in the United States is genetically modified almost makes me have a tear in my eye, okay? 99.9% .9 of all soybeans that are grown in America are genetically modified. Now, I moved away from home when I was pretty young, and I remember visiting Iowa after I moved to Denver, Colorado, which was kind of like, uh, they call it a granola city. You know, it's kind of hippy-dippy, there's a lot of outdoorsy types, snowboarding, X, Y, Z. I revisited Iowa, and I remember feeling like I was in total culture shock. I went to the Walmart with my mom, because this is where everybody buys their food in middle America. And you could see the people around you didn't look well. You know, people look sick. People are obese, okay? Western disease is an absolute epidemic in that space. And when you pick up the boxes of food in the center aisles of the grocery store, and this goes across all of the Western world, it's not just America. You know, those boxes are full of preservatives, toxins, um, chemical coloring, I mean, you name it. But in America, what is unique is that when you look at those boxes, every single one of those boxes contains corn and soybeans grown with these genetically modified organisms. And you can see it on the faces of the people. You know, and I knew, like, right then and there that I had to move away from the grocery store if I was going to, you know, maintain my health. At that time, I didn't, you know, I didn't put the whole picture together. You know, I was just a kid. But I left there I you know, went back to Denver and then moved to San Francisco a year later, but from then on out, I didn't shop in the grocery store anymore. I was into my co-ops, I was into my farmer's markets, I was trying to eat health, healthy, real food. You know, and the more I thought about this, you know, the, more, the more I worried about it. You know, these regular conventional grocery stores, you know, maybe in, in those center aisles, it's obvious because it's written on the packet, but on the periphery of the grocery store, the dairy, the meat, you know, it doesn't say on there genetically modified GMO, it doesn't say corn, it doesn't say soybean, but what are those cows eating in the winter time? You know, those cows that are producing the dairy and they're producing uh, the meat, you know? Um, so it's, and, and it's not unique to just America because we're producing, they're producing so much corn and soy, it's infiltrating the global industry, okay? 
<laughs> it's not written on, you know, it's not written on the packet of meat that they're eating corn and soy or they're being supplemented at certain times of the year. But I mean, we all know this is a problem. So this is really where this is really where my journey began. Um, I met my husband in let's see, 2008. We got married in 2010, and we started a family. I was determined to stay home with my children and rear them in a natural rhythm of life. It was really important to me that they, you know, stayed home with me. They learned to do chores. They bake. They cook. They garden. Do all the things that you know we probably would have done, you know, if we were born. 50 or 75 or 100 years ago. <clears throat> um, so, yes, so I was determined to, to rear them in a different way. And uh, fermentation goes hand in hand with a person who is trying to eat seasonally and locally because it allows us to preserve the foods when they're abundant, um, you know, for to, to eat locally all year round, really. Now, living in California, there's tons and tons of food available. <laughs> all year round. Um, but so what happened with our family is we went to buy a house and we figured out that we couldn't really, what we could afford in you know San Francisco, San Francisco city proper was a two bed, no backyard in like a really bad neighborhood. So I convinced my husband, who's originally from Black Rock, <laughs> let's just look and see about these farms, you know, because it, it was always a dream of mine to, to move to the country. Now I didn't grow up in the country in Iowa. My, my grandparents had a farm, and they were hunters, and they kept a cow, and you know, if you're having fried chicken, you're getting it from the backyard, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I always really wanted to, um, you know, move back to the countryside. So we decided just on a whim that we'd have a look at Daft IE, and what we could get for our money, for the same money we would have got for that crappy, slummy two-bed, was a six-acre farm in beautiful Glen Creek. So we... Uh, up and hightailed it eventually when they decided to sell the house to us um, to Glen Cree, and that was in 2017. I had started baking bread really seriously in 2012. I got really into bread baking and sourdough bread baking. Um, so I bake all of my family's bread. We don't we haven't purchased bread, you know, since 2012. I mean, unless we were at a specialized bakery just to taste it. No shop bread. Um, so I had a dream that I wanted to become a professional baker. Now, this wasn't possible for me when my kids were little. I had three kids in four years, so I was bound, bound to them. Um, but when I moved to Ireland, I had been following Joe Fitzmorris of uh, Riot Rye. I'm sure you guys all know who this dude is, <laughs> right? <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> so I had been following him on Instagram before I even um, had moved to Glen Cree or moved to Ireland. And the first thing that I did basically was go down to see him. I was dying to see this oven. Those ovens are built all along the California coast. Um, that lots of famous bakers are associated with them. But I went to go to see Joe, and I wanted to see his oven and take his workshop. And I got to know him, and it was like that. The minute that I met Joe, <laughs> saw his oven, I decided I was building one of those ovens in my backyard. <laughs> um, so we back home to Glen Cree, and we started to put the wheels in motion. As you know, it's not easy to... To, um, to build something. I don't know if it's unique to Ireland, but <laughs> it was really tricky to get the right builder, to get the right planner, to get the planning permission, especially in the <laughs> planning permission was, you know, here we are, we're, we're like at least a year and a half into it now. Decided I wanted to build a bakehouse. But in the interim, I was looking for something to do. And I had had so many friends coming into my kitchen over the years saying, you know, your kitchen is very witchy. These all look like potions. What the hell are they? And I start to break it down, and people are saying, you've got to teach people about this stuff. People don't know. People want to know. And I thought there was no way that there would be anyone interested in partially rotten cabbage. <laughs> but as it turns out, they are. So it's been an amazing experience. The workshops are brilliant. You know, everyone that I've had to my workshops, we host two workshops a month, one for sourdough bread and one for introduction to fermentation, which is you know, focused on sauerkraut and kombucha. Every single person who's come up to my home for these workshops has been super sound, like <laughs> unbelievably sound, like the kind of people that you'd want to have over for dinner, like, or be neighbors with, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's really sparked an awesome, uh, awesome community around me that I'm, I'm super pumped about. So I want to talk to you guys about culture now, these cultures that we have. So we make all these things. We're also, we also have a small food production business, so I make kombucha, 
and sauerkraut to sell in the market. And as soon as that oven is finished being built, we're going to have community bread. <laughs> and, and it's scary. <laughs> it's really out there. Um, so we, I have brought a whole bunch of cultures here to share with you all today. We have kombucha cultures and water kefir and sourdough bread. You guys are welcome. There's enough for everyone to, I think for 70, there was enough for everyone to take at least one. So think about which one you want. Um, if you're not already following us on Instagram, we have a whole bunch of tutorials and recipes there um, to help guide you get through this, the making of these awesome things. Can you plug the Instagram for a follow? Can I plug the Instagram? Tell them, tell them your Instagram. <laughs> Like, oh, I'm so sorry. The plug. I'm like, am I just an old lady that I don't know what that means? I'm so sorry. What is the name of your Instagram account? Sorry. It's at river underscore run underscore ferments. It's right here on the, if you take your culture, it's right there on the sticker. <laughs> okay, so we'll save the questions for the end. Thank you very much. Thank you.